Welcome to Zero Knowledge, a podcast where we explore the latest in blockchain technology and the decentralized web. The show is hosted by me, Anna. And me, Frederick. In this episode, we sit down with Nigel Smart, a professor in cryptology, to talk about multi-party computation. Before we start, we want to say thank you to this week's sponsor, Starkware. Starkware will be putting together the Starkware sessions in Tel Aviv on September 16th. The event will be bringing together the brightest minds in the field of zero-knowledge proofs from both the academic and application arenas. Topics that will be discussed are self-custodial trading, Starks for Layer 1, Stark-friendly hash functions, and other cool things you can do with Stark proofs. Also, I will be hosting one of the stages. So if you're interested in this exciting, cutting-edge tech, do join the Starkware sessions. Or come a day early for the Stark 101 workshop, where you could build a Stark prover from scratch. Use the code ZKPODCAST to get 20% off any ticket. We have about 50 of these available, so get it fast. So again, thank you, Starkware, for supporting this podcast. And now, here's our interview with Nigel Smart. So we want to sit down today and talk about MPC systems. And we have one of the possibly best guests to do so, Nigel Smart, a professor at cryptology at KU Leuven and the co-founder of Unbound Tech. Welcome to the show, Nigel. Oh, welcome. Nice to be here. And we have Anna with us as usual. Hello. Hello. So to kick it off, Nigel, if you can think back to when you first started in this space, what is it about cryptography that really got you excited and wanted to, to work in this space? Okay, so originally I uh, trained as a mathematician and, um, and then I realized there really wasn't much money in that. And so it was much, if, you go, if you're doing this kind of maths I was doing and you go, I want to make money or I don't want to be poor, then what you do is you, you do cryptography, which in those days in the uh, like mid nineties was just beginning to be deployed, um, you know, everywhere because the internet had just started, etc. I know a lot of people who got into cryptography through like the military. So either <laughs> through in, in Sweden, we have like this thing you go through for a year and a half or something. Um, they get into through that. Did you ever have that exposure to like the military side of it? Um, not really. Um, of course, uh, when you turn up at uh, all the international conferences, there are various people from various government agencies there, some with three letter and acronyms and some with four, some with five, depending on the country. Um, and they always try and pretend they're not there, but they are. And so you kind of, you kind of get to see these people. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question about um, what you're working on right now, because you're a professor of cryptology, not Cryptography? Yeah. What is the difference between those two things? Okay, so cryptology is the science of making and breaking ciphers. So cryptography is the science of making ciphers, and cryptanalysis is the science of breaking them. And if you do both, you do cryptology. So the um, oh. International Association, um, which represents all the cryptographers in the world, is called the International Association of Cryptologic Research even though everyone in it is a cryptographer. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you're one of the first, maybe not the first guests, but you're one of the few guests that we've had on um, that aren't necessarily coming straight out of the blockchain space. Uh -huh. But my question is, have you, I mean, what is your interaction with the blockchain space? Because I understand you have done some work with yeah. groups. In so, it. okay. So first you've got to understand that blockchain isn't cryptocurrencies. So, so there's two, there's two, there's two uh, mantras in cryptography is crypto means cryptology <laughs> or crypto means cryptography, not cryptocurrency. And the other one is blockchain does not mean cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, blockchains have a lot of applications outside of the cryptocurrency space. And also in terms of corporate land, a lot of, uh, so a lot of blockchains do not necessarily need, uh, proofs of work. So you can do, um, so what proof of work gives you in, in something like Bitcoin is it solves the consensus problem. 
But there are other ways of solving consensus problems if you have so-called uh, provision blockchain. So there's a lot of applications around that use a blockchain as but with provision provision services. And basically there what you're doing is you're using a blockchain as a what's called a like an append only database. So it allows you to do database applications which are slightly simpler than using standard distributed databases where you have issues of locking and unlocking, etc. Yes, yeah, so I've been uh, advised to a number of companies in this space, in mainly in the financial sector. That's interesting. Have you, so you've you've touched a lot of these uh, quote unquote private blockchains, but have you have you touched anything in the public space? I mean, there's like Zcash and a lot of these newer, fancier things. Yeah. Okay. So I haven't touched explicit- complicated crypto. <laughs> so I haven't explicitly worked on on uh, any of the uh, the public blockchain applications like Zcash. But I know the people behind them, and we all talk to each other, and so yeah. So it's a very, very small community yeah. um, who know what know what's going on. Particularly Zcash, I think. I mean, we're going to be talking today about MPC, and they have yeah. a very, very famous case of using MPC. I think, yeah, I think in the in in the blockchain community, um, the first you know thing that made people in the blockchain in the community understand what MPC was doing was the Zcash opening ceremony. Which was, you know, kind of an interesting one-off application. But what you're actually seeing, um, especially in return to um, when you go to uh, cryptocurrencies, is crypto custodianship. Is a lot of um, applications now there for MPC to do um, authorization and signing operations, um, which are more efficient and match. Uh, the application much better than previously. So this uh, cryptocurrency is good in that it generates lots of interesting, unlike normal financial institutions or normal companies that they are definitely early adopters of high tech. <laughs> One thing our listeners may be noticing is the way that we're pronouncing MPC. Yeah. <laughs> and not saying MPCs. Because as I learned recently from Nigel, that's actually very incorrect to use MPC. In plural, yeah. NPCs doesn't make sense. So tell us why that is. <laughs> okay, so when you have when you talk about a zero knowledge proof, it's a thing. So you can talk about plural things. So you can talk about zero knowledge proofs. So you can talk about, you can talk about ZKPs. So that makes sense. Whereas MPC stands for multi party computation. Therefore, it's a technology, and if you pluralized it, you'd be talking about multi party computations. And therefore, you're talking about something that's a, a process is, that's going on rather than a technology. So, it, so if you if you want to talk about the technology and pluralize it, it's like you might have a piece of software that does one version of MPC and another version of software that does MPC. They w- these would be two MPC systems. So, yeah. <laughs> Got it. Thank you for sharing that with us and for clarifying. I know that I think. We and others in the space have made this mistake a lot, and so this is good to know. <laughs> yeah. It's, whenever you have initials, it's always good to understand what, go back to what they actually stand for to decide whether you can pluralize it or not. <laughs> can you say FHEs? Well, you can talk about FHEs if you're talking about the ciphertext because they're encryption. So if you take an encryption of X and an encryption of Y, then they are encryptions. But they are, you're actually talking about the specific encryptions of X and Y. Whereas if you want to talk about FHE as a technology or different types of technology, you talk about FHE technologies. Like if you're saying NPCs, you're talking about the actual computations that are taking place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did an episode on NPC uh, on this podcast before and, uh, you know, if I'm honest with myself, it's probably not the best intro ever. Uh, but it was just it was just you and me. It was, me. it was just myself and Frederick. So this wasn't like we're putting any guest under the bus here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm curious to hear from you, Nigel. What would your like short introduction to just explaining what MPC is be? Okay, so imagine you've got two sets of data or three sets of data or four sets of data and you want to compute a function on the joint data without revealing what the data is. And you want to, you do this via a protocol by doing a computation. So it's multiple parties, multiple pieces of data, doing a computation on their joint input 
with, and the only thing you learn is the output. So a really good example, a practical example that's used is hospitals. Hospitals have information on patients and you might want to do some medical uh, statistical experiment. So you can do a medical statistical experiment on the joint data of the hospitals without each hospital having to reveal the information about their patients. What would that look like on the on the sort of technical front? Like, would that actually be each hospital like running something on yeah. a computer? Like, what would that look like? So it looked like um, each hospital would have their own separate database and they would have computers that are attached to the database and the computers would pull the data from their own database and then engage in a protocol with the other hospitals. And at the end of the protocol, out pops the statistical answer you want and what doesn't pop out to either hospital is the other hospital's data. And this is mathematically guaranteed this doesn't pop out. So it's, you don't, you know, no matter how much, you know, uh, hackery you do, you're guaranteed that there's no extra information that jumps out. Does it also, I guess it also guarantees that the information that is shared or that like that metric is correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you also get correctness of the results. So um, you can't protect against people lying. So if one hospital lies about its data, that's all you can do. But you can uh, you can prevent a hospital, one of the hospitals, doing the wrong calculation. So they all agree on the right calculation. They have to both do the same calculation. So in in our introduction episode, we covered MPC from the perspective of of like solving polynomials. Like that's our that's our fundamentals that we go into. Would you say that modern MPC systems are still like fundamentally you know constructing and and solving polynomial equations or has it moved way beyond that oh it's, yeah it's not just solving polynomial equations so you can do any computation so from the 80s we knew that any any anything you can compute in the clear we can compute securely yeah so if you have any computation you want to do in theory we can do that computation in practice that depends on the technology and what you want to do but in theory we can compute anything so it's it's so a, a, a really good example that was done in a U.S. government program a few years ago is satellite. Um, there are two satellites going around the, around the Earth, and sometimes satellites hit each other, and it's really expensive. Okay, so but what you want to do is you want to avoid, make sure the satellites don't hit each other. On the other hand, countries aren't really very keen at re- on revealing where their satellite actually is. Yeah. <laughs> so you can imagine you know, the fact that the satellite is going over a country, you might not want to know that. So you could actually. So what we, uh, what some people did in that uh, U.S. government program I was involved in is that they actually did an MPC calculation where you had one country knew where its satellite was and what direction it was going in, and another one was, and you would work out whether the satellites were going to hit each other and whether they should change course without wow. revealing the positions of the satellites. So you could do computations which are like Newtonian mechanics. Other examples could be. Um, we're engaged in here. We, um, I don't know, your listeners may not know this, but we're actually in three different countries here. So this is, <laughs> this is, uh, we're in three different countries. And actually, when you do a merging audio, you actually have a problem. So, um, so if you, if you have encrypted communications, um, you actually have to decrypt them to merge the audios for group conversations. So this is actually, and we, in, in the same U.S. government program, we actually had encrypted communications from three voice communications from three different sites. The voice communications were encrypted, but then merged where you merge the audio files and then send them wow. back out in real time during the conversation. So that's kind of like being able, what Skype currently does is you connect to Skype huh. and it will do, it will merge the three together by decrypting and having to do the merging on the fly when you do a group conversation because that's actually quite hard, but we managed to do this in, in a secure domain. Those are two really, those are amazing examples. Yeah, really, really cool. So you can really see that this has applications. So we talked about healthcare. We talked about military applications, you know, with satellites. We can talk about uh, uh, voice applications in the cryptocurrency space. Um, you can secure your cryptographic keys to signing by, you can take your crypto, cryptographic signing key you can split that up and put those in different servers and then use those and then do an MPC calculation to actually do the digital signature. So there's the, the key is never in one place. It's much more secure. You could have this one signing key in Berlin, one signing key in America, 
or one's part of it in, in Japan and they never come together. So this pr- pr- has solves the problem of where do you keep your cold and hot wallet keys? Wow, that's super interesting. Is that is that actually does that exist? That's not like that exists. It sounds sounds like a multi sig, but I feel like it's, it's a not a multi sig. It's not a multi sig. <laughs> yeah. It's better than a multi sig because a multi sig requires the recipient to know it's a multi sig, so it looks different. Yeah, and it also a, a multi sig. Suppose you have a multi sig which says we're going to take three signatures and combine them. Then what that actually tells the verifier is that your authorization policy was three people had to agree. And you might not actually want that to happen. So what what we can do with MPC is produce what looks to the verifier like a genuine signature, looks like a normal, normal, normal signature. And then, but from the signer's point of view, it is the it has been composed of different secret keys with different authorizations. So it could be um, that you allow me on my own to sign a transaction. But Anna and Frederick have to get together to sign it because we don't trust them too much. Okay, so they have to come together. So we have there, we could have a, what's called an access structure where you have two people have to sign or one person. And similar things have been used, not in terms of MPC, but that kind of access structure is used for nuclear command and control. Yeah, so launching nuclear missiles, you require the president and the submarine commander or the vice president, the submarine commander, and a general, or something like that. You need a a combination. So you have these different access structures, and you can do that within um, the signature on the blockchain in a way that the verifier doesn't know what your authorization policy was behind, which could be company confidential. And then to, is this deployed? Yes. Unbound Tech produced tech in this space, and it's actually deployed in a reasonable number of the very large cryptocurrency exchanges to um, secure their cold and hot wallet keys. And it also means that they have they can do uh, greater volumes of turnaround and, and less and less uh, delay for consumers. I actually think there's some application. We've talked about Bitcoin bridges in the past, and like a constraint in Bitcoin is that you can't have multi sigs above a certain number of parties. Yeah. But in a bridge, you might actually want a multi-sig of like a thousand parties. Yeah. And um, you, can't, you can't do that natively on Bitcoin. So you would have to do something like this. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. That exactly solves that problem. Would you say, I mean, are, is, are MPC systems the focus of your research? And have they been the focus of your research? Or was there something else that you were working on before this? Oh, before this, I was doing all sorts of stuff I've done. Um, so originally... I worked on what's called, oh, you would know this. I worked on things called elliptic curve cryptography. Um, this was back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, where we looked at ways of breaking elliptic curve cryptography and stuff. And then there was this big boom in the early 2000s on what's called pairing-based cryptography, which um, has is used in um, some blockchain applications. So, for example, I think uh, a big, uh, Definity, I think, is, is a big user of uh, uh pairing-based crypto in some of its applications. Um, and then worked on key agreement, all sorts of other things. So various um, things. And then um, kind of in the mid-2000s, there were kind of two things. So so I would always turn up to MPC talks. You know, plural, it's talks. There we go. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're talks about MPC. Um, anyway, so I talked, to, um, so I would always turn up to MPC talks and fall asleep because this was just so boring. This was just like, this was never going to be practical. MPC had been around since the 1980s. It was very, very theoretical and no one would ever think you could ever use it. And then in the mid 2000s, um, I think it was like 2004, I think it was. I went to um, a Eurocrypt, which is the main cryptography conference for Europe in Interlaken in Switzerland. And um, it, at cryptography conferences, we have something called a rump session. Now, a rump session is a uh, an event in one of the evenings where people drink a lot of beer and a lot of wine and people give two minute talks. And they're just giving two minute talks, which are either funny, an advertisement, or they're demonstrating something. And one guy got up and he actually in two minutes, live, gave a demonstration of MPC working on his laptop. Now, in a two-minute presentation where you have to get the presentation onto the stage and actually do, actually get it running and working, you go, and you go like, oh, oh, this isn't theoretical anymore. This is real. And then um, the next year, there was a Eurocrypt, this time in Aarhus in Denmark, 
And at the same thing at the rump session, um, someone got up and said, actually, we've used MPC to do a real calculation in the real world for real people, which is what's called, uh, which was the calculation which is now famous in the MPC community as the Danish sugar beet auction. So you can't mention MPC without mentioning Danish sugar beet auction. And at that point, I went, aha, it really is real. And then I kind of like shifted. And then we started doing, I started working with Yehuda Lindel, who's the other uh, co-founder of Unbound Tech, and also working with Benny Pinkers, who's the guy who'd given the rump session talk at um, Interlaken. And we started actually then sort of building MPC and seeing whether we could turn the theory into practice. Um, and to give you an idea, um, we did the first very large scale, what's called actively secure, which is like the gold standard of security computation in 2007, 2008. And we calculated a specific function. It doesn't matter what it is. We calculated a specific function. At that point was the first time anyone had ever done it. It took hours, wow. hours. And now that same calculation can now be done in milliseconds. So in wow. 10 years, the speed the performance improvement has just dramatically dropped. And that's why it's become so hot. I sort of want to go back to that beginning, that early MPC work that you were doing. What was that actually, what did that look like? Well, okay. So for me, okay. So it, well, I, I could talk about the community or for me. So it's kind of like different. So in the, in the community in the eighties, people were just doing pen and paper, you know, um, they were doing thought experiments, you know, what would happen? So the first example is mental poker in some sense. How could you play poker by telephone? So I've got a bunch, I've got a bunch of, of cards. You've got a bunch of cards. We've dealt the cards. I don't know what your cards are. You don't know what my cards are, but we want to play poker and not cheat over the telephone by just exchanging cryptographic messages. So people were just playing mental games like that. And they came up with this idea of MPC and and then in the 80s and early 90s, people were just playing with the idea, what could it theoretically do? Could you compute anything? And it turns out you can. You could theoretically compute anything you want securely, which is kind of cool. And then maybe from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, people were kind of coming up with ways of doing the computations, but they weren't really very practical. And the networks weren't very good at the time and computers weren't so fast, et cetera, et cetera. And then, like, in the mid-2000s, computers were just about fast enough that you could do something really basic. So I think the idea, um, there's this famous example um, which uh, was came up in the 80s, which called the millionaire's problem. So imagine you've got two millionaires, and they want to work out who's the richest. So they want to compute. They've both got their inputs. So one input, one millionaire's got the value X, one millionaire's got the value Y, and you want to work out is X bigger than Y or is Y bigger than X? And that's all you want to compute without revealing X or Y. So the only information, so you've got two millionaires, Alice and Bob. Alice will learn maybe she's the richest and Bob will learn he's the poorest, but we won't know by how much. So that's what's called the millionaire's problem. And what this guy had done in uh, this rump session in Interlaken is run the millionaire's problem on 16-bit integers. So which is a number, which isn't even a million <laughs> That's like less than 65536, yeah? So this is comparing two numbers less than 16 bits, and it took two minutes. That's just the length of his talk to compare the integers. <laughs> yeah. um, and, but that was kind of, but that was kind of, that's where we were. But as soon as you could do something, as soon as you could actually implement something and play with it, you would then implement it and you go, aha, I can make this go faster, I can make that go faster, I don't need to do this. I can change that. I can use this part of the infrastructure. I can use the operating system in this way. I can use the network in this way. And suddenly the improvements come rapidly, you know, one on top of each other. So what you just talked about is sort of this um, bridge or this this gap between research and engineering. And mm -hmm. I it, we've talked to people on the show before about this, and I, it's always fascinating to me what I see is exactly what you said, that once there's something out there to play with, that's when you start attracting the engineers. And once you have the engineers on board, they can go, well, actually, I can speed this up a little bit. I can do this over here. And you start having the hackers actually like improve the technology. And then you start mm -hmm. working more hand in hand. And that's when you get the real improvements. 
you know, we'll, how do you see the role of like engineering and, and the, the programmers coming in and working with the theorists? Well, I think the thing is, certainly in, in this area, actually everyone's hand in hand. There's still some theorists doing theoretical MPC in the, in the world, but almost everyone's now doing a combination of theory and practice is that because you can't, so you have a new idea to, to improve some protocol. So you have some new weird and wacky idea. Actually testing it on paper, you can't test it on paper because in the real world, everything works on, you know, what's the network latency, memory issues, bandwidth. And, and these systems are now so complicated. They have so many moving parts that you can't really test whether something's real or not or whether it gives you an improvement without actually implementing it. So a lot of the theoretical research now is hand in hand with um, engineering research. And also the engineering research requires the theoreticians to, you know, solve problems or you do a piece of engineering and you go, Oh my God, that's something we never realized. And then you pass it back to the, the theoreticians. Um, and they go, Oh yeah, we, um, you know, they kind of measure the wrong things. And then you suddenly realize that you've got some one thing you're meant, meant to be measuring in the theory world doesn't actually make sense in the practical world. And you, there's this a never ending combination of, you know, Theory to practice, practice to theory, and so on. So maybe 10 years ago in the crypto community, that's crypto means cryptography. <laughs> Always got to get that in. Always got to get that in. <laughs> crypto means cryptography. Okay. In the crypto community, we were, there was a kind of like, there's a bit of a bifurcation between the theoreticians and the practitioners. But I think a lot of uh, things over the last, you know, uh, seven or eight years have actually brought them together. One of which has been this huge explosion in MPC applications and practicality, which suddenly the theoreticians are going, woohoo, our stuff's useful. Um, <laughs> and the practical people go, woohoo, we've got something else to play with. And then there was the huge explosion in fully homomorphic encryption. And, um, and then also we've kind of created, uh, community places for people to come together. So, I founded, along with someone else, Kenny Patterson, this thing called Real World Crypto, which we run every year in January. And it turned from being like seven years ago, it was like a tiny event with 100 people. It's now the biggest cryptography conference in the world. You know, it's, uh, we have like wow. 700 people turn up and we have people from the cryptocurrency space. We have people from academia, we have people from government. We have, you know, the crypto teams of Apple and Facebook and Google and Microsoft turn up. Um, we have people from who who are interested in public policy. Um, last year, we had people doing MPC, doing a really interesting survey in Boston, which was the, the Boston Agenda Survey, where they got two hundred companies to do a statistical survey of of whether there was a difference in pay between male and female in the different companies, and so they got all the companies to put their data into this MPC system to do the statistical analysis. So we're seeing all sorts of you know, uh, public policy stuff coming out that's really bringing people together. You just mentioned sort of the the FHE idea. Yeah. I'm not going to say FHE is here. <laughs> um, FHE. Actually, the way you've defined the MPC, it sounds very, very similar to the FHE, this idea of this ability to combine things and yeah. almost anything. Yeah. In the work that you're doing, I mean, do you see the, the work on MPC as a, as a silo or do you actually see that blending in with a lot of these other oh, they're, concepts. They're very, very similar. In fact, they actually are really related. Okay, so the okay. okay, so the thing with the usual use case of FHE is that what well, there's pretended that people say is you encrypt some stuff, you send it to the server, the server computes on it without knowing what it is and sends it back to you. So you think about an encrypted Google search. You encrypt your search term, you send it to Google, Google gives you your search results but doesn't know what you've searched for or what your results are, sends them back and you decrypt. Okay, that doesn't isn't practical, but that gives you an idea of what the idea is. Now, that really is like MPC, except there's only one person doing the computation, the server. So it's it's okay. MP, FHE is MPC without the M. Wow. Uh, and so it's really which is the really easy way to think about it. So it's very, very similar. However, they're not very not a separate. So one of the big breakthroughs we had is uh, is we have an MPC uh, protocol called Speeds, which is uh, spelt S-P-D-Z for the authors, which is Smart Padro 
Dan Gard and Zacharias. So usually in cryptography, you put things in alphabetical order, but someone realized that if you reordered our names, it would be speeds because it was a really fast protocol. And that's, those are awesome. It's like <laughs> yeah. Nizik and Dizik and yeah, Bulletproof. Exactly. And, yeah. Yours, naming is important. Naming is really, really important. <laughs> we have actually, whenever we do something, we come up with a really cool name to make sure people remember it. So speeds everyone remembers. And this came out in about 2012. And what speeds does is actually it uses FHE to do MPC. So it uses F, it uses a form of FHE, which Usually people go, that's totally impractical. But we use FHE to actually make things go faster than if we didn't have FHE. So we can mm. actually, we use FHE within the MPC calculation as, as an accelerant to make it go faster. So to dig in a little bit more and get, like, I want a better practical understanding of how these MPC systems work. So maybe we take speeds as an example and, like, explain how that protocol works. Okay, so imagine we've got three of us. we got myself, we've got Adam, we've got Frederick, and um, we um, we have some piece of data. So imagine, don't worry about putting data into the system or out of the system. Just think at the moment of how you actually do computation. So if we have a variable in a program, let's think of the variable, call it X. So what we do with that variable is we split it into three. and we So we write X as X1 plus X2 plus X3. So Anna gets X3, Frederick gets X2, and I get X1. Now, if, because remember, they're untrustworthy, if Anna and Frederick get together, they're at least trusted, right? So if, if with just X2 and X3, they can learn nothing about X. It's only the three of us together know something about X, okay? So in my piece of that, when I'm running the program, I only hold X1, Frederick only holds X2, and Anna holds X3. Now, suppose we have another variable, call it Y. We have y1, y2, and y3 in the same way. Now, if we want to add the variables together to get z equals x plus y, then all that I have to do is go z1 equals x1 plus y1. Frederick goes z2 equals x2 plus y2. Anna goes z3 equals x3 plus y3. And then miraculously, z is actually z1 plus z2 plus z3 by the magic of maths. Okay, so... That turns out, well, so what that means is what's called linear operations are for free, is that you don't have to do anything clever to do linear operations. So addition is a linear operation, multiplication by constants are linear operations. So the only difficulty seems to be doing nonlinear operations. Now, the simplest nonlinear operation you have is multiplication. Yes. Well, after you do addition at school, you do multiplication. So for multiplication, there's all sorts of complicated ways of doing multiplication. And it's very hard to do on a podcast because you need lots of blackboards and stuff. But what Speed does is it uses homomorphic encryption to enable you to do the multiplication fast. So we just, so instead of using the homomorphic encryption to do an arbitrary computation, which is very expensive, we'd use the homomorphic encryption to just do a very simple operation, which is multiplication. And that means that we can make the multiplication go very fast. To do the multiplication, we have to communicate data. So I send some data to Frederick. I send some data to Anna. Anna sends some data to Frederick and me. And Frederick sends some data to Anna and me. But So this data is transmitted around. But this data reveals nothing about the actual underlying secrets. But then we can produce a multiplication. And it turns out that any computation that you can think of can be written as a, as, as a sequence of pluses and multiplies. Okay, so we just then need a compiler, which takes our program, turns it into a sequence of pluses and multiplies. Not quite, this is simplifying a bit. And then we just run that, and then we've got our secure computation. So you uh, basically use, as you described before, FHEs to, you know, operate on this very small domain where it's really fast, and therefore can can speed up the, the complicated part of MPC. Yeah, exactly. So that's one way of doing MPC. There's another way of doing MPC, which is um, due to Andy Yao, which is called, which uh, people might have heard of, which is called Yao circuits or garbled circuits. And here what you do is you represent the function as a binary circuit, just like it would be on a, on a microprocessor on the chip in electronics and silicon. And so it turns out there that you can represent everything as a bunch of ands and sores and ors and not gates, yeah? And here what you do is that you actually produce 
the, the, the lookup table, the truth table for the, um, for the, for the binary operation, you actually form an encrypted version of the truth table. And there, what you use is you use a standard cipher like AES to do the encryption of the truth table. And then you, when you evaluate the computation, you are basically decrypting parts of the truth tables and working through the circuit. So there's kind of two different ways of doing it. There's the secret sharing approach of like of speeds. And then there's the encrypted truth table approach of, of, of garbled circuits. Since you've actually been working in the space for like a pretty good amount of time and you've seen this develop, I would be really curious to hear what you think of some other maybe comparable systems or okay. systems that have been compared. You might not think of them in the same category, but for example, um, we actually not too long ago also did an episode on TEEs. Okay. TEEs. Yeah. Can, can we say TEEs? Yeah. Can I pluralize that one? Because it's an environment. is the thing. It's the thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. So I am very curious to hear what do you think of TEEs and do you see a relationship between TEEs and MPC? Because we w- we've often heard them lumped together or compared and I wonder what you think. Well, it's of that. kind of interesting. Okay, so a TE is a trusted execution environment. So it, as we see it now, it's something like ARM Trust Zone or Intel SGX. Actually, if you go back to the very first paper on fully homomorphic encryption, which was in 1978. Okay, so this is a long time ago. In 1978, the paper on fully homomorphic encryption by Rivest, etc. He they had two ideas in this paper. The first idea is, wouldn't it be good if someone could invent fully homomorphic encryption? Because then we could compute on data without seeing it. And, they, and then they said, but that looks really hard. So why don't we just encrypt the stuff going into the microprocessor? And they said, well, you, what you could do is you could put a little encryption device as the data goes into the microprocessor. So the registers in the microprocessor are in the clear. But as the data comes out, it's decrypted. It's encrypted. So it's decrypted going in and encrypted going out. And then he went, and they also said, but that's also a just stupid idea because actually, um, this was 1970s technology. The best cipher they had was DES, which was terribly slow, even in hardware. And even microprocessors then were faster than the DES. So they couldn't get the data in quick enough and out. Enough. So that was considered a no-go. So what's kind of interesting is when FHE started becoming interesting in like 2009 when Craig Gentry came up with the first FHE implementation, first FHE idea. At the same time, people also revisited this idea of putting a little encryption device on the bus going into a microprocessor to encrypt the stuff coming in and out. And of course, now with microprocessors, actually it's the bus is the slow thing. So slowing it down a little bit by just AES encrypting stuff doesn't really cost much. Okay. Because Getting data in and out of the processor is the slow bit of the computation. So now, and that's then led to TEs like the Intel SGX. So they are, they're historically, they are absolutely come from the same source. So very similar. However, Intel and the others made a very interesting decision when they decided to do, uh, build the TE. So inside a microprocessor, it has to make decisions. And, and as it makes decisions, it leaks power or it leaks radiation or it leaks heat or sound or whatever. And so they explicitly excluded from the TE design these what's called side channel attacks. And therefore, TEs are only trusted if you trust no one to actually monitor the device and, and break it. So there's... What you just said there about the energy and radi- like the kind of yeah. heat coming off it. What, are you talking about that idea that like because you could track spikes in yeah. heat and energy consumption, you could potentially crack... Yeah, you can see it. What's in there? You can see it. That's okay, right. Crazy. So, can, <laughs> that's so, cr- that's so, so cool. And the banking industry is known as, known as radio. So maybe some of your US listeners are kind of like, have only just got a, a pin, chip and pin card for doing transactions, or there's chip and signature in the US. In the rest of the world, we've been using chip and bit, pin um, for about 20 years. And the chip and pin cards, um, the, the banks have known that the chips could be uh, broken by measuring power consumption. Um, and electromagnetic radiation for years. And so there's been a lot of work to actually secure chip and pin cards against these kind of attacks. So this is big business. It, it goes back, that even goes back to the 60s. People would program these big computers in the 60s and they would know what was happening in the computer. They didn't have debuggers. GDB did not exist. And so what you would do is you'd listen to the computer and you would go, it would go like, uh, 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 oh, it's stuck in loop four. 
because you knew the sound of the loop of what the computer sound was making by actually the sounds coming out. So this side channel attacks were actually used as debuggers in the 1960s. Wow. And so TEs, as as we're talking about them, those are not protected against They are this? not protected against side channel oh. attacks as a deliberate design decision. So if you put your trusted execution environment in the hands of the bad guy, then it's... And they have the right tools. And they have I the guess. right tools. They can... So, yeah. So this is, this is uh, one of oh. the problems with TEs have... And it's a deliberate design decision. I think the assumption is, is if this T is running in a cloud server, you don't trust Amazon to, uh, you know, you, well, you trust Amazon not to put a lot of electromagnetic radiation equipment to measure around the, the server because that's already, but you probably don't want the data in the clear on, on the Amazon server itself or Microsoft server or whatever. So they are, so they are, they have advantages to use, but they're not the panacea that everyone seems to, okay. Let's just face it. No technology is a panacea, right? <laughs> so MPC has a problem. FHE has a problem. TEs have a problem. Everything has a problem. But TE's problem is side channel attacks. Yeah. Well, that and the, the fact that they have this attestation thing. So you actually need to trust Intel to attest yeah, yeah, to yeah. whatever you're doing. Yeah, because otherwise, like how, do you, how do you know it's actually yeah. a, T, a real, real TE? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny to hear you say, like, it's, it's not the panacea that everyone seems to think it is because... In, in my bubble, in the space that I move, everyone hates them. Like, no one, no one wants to use them. No one wants to, well, like... Well, everyone <laughs> hates everything. So let's, yeah, just, yeah. let's just say every. So I hear people really love something or they hate it. It's kind of like... We, uh, I'm English, so we have this thing called Marmite, which is something you either love or hate. Yeah. So all technologies, yeah. all, all technologies Marmite. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Another idea... This is more maybe in the zero-knowledge proof camp, yep. but... You know, because there's snarks and snarks require a trusted setup and yep. a trusted setup, an MPC can be quite laborious and requires some sort of social organization. And it can actually be potentially dangerous that, mm -hmm. you know, this, what did you call it? The ser the random string. Common the, um, the common reference string. Yeah, that the common reference string could actually be discovered somehow. Yep. So that poses a danger. So we see new systems coming out where they've actually removed the need for an MPC, like Bulletproofs yep. and Starks. And I'm wondering what you think about those. Okay, so the, the, okay, so why, the reason you want to use these things is because you want to do zero-knowledge proofs of complex statements. And you want to do that efficiently. Now, the question is, what do you mean by efficient? So efficient could be fast for the prover. It could be fast for the verifier. It could be low communication cost. The size of the proof is small. And each one of those three technologies optimizes one. And so, so the goal is, is, you know, the perfect zero knowledge proof would be fast for the prover, fast for the verifier and no space. Yeah. And, so, <laughs> and no setup. Uh, and no setup. Yeah. So you have these, <laughs> you have these different competing things. And currently the level of technology is, is we don't know how to do all good things at once. Mm -hmm. So you basically, the starts, the, Bulletproofs, etc., and 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 um, the snarks and whatever, they all optimize different things. On the other hand, there is another technology to do zero knowledge proofs called MPC in the head, <laughs> which is really really funky. So, is it actually called MPC in, in the, the head? head? Yeah. What does that mean? Okay, so. <laughs> The idea of, so let's go back to our example where we, like I, said, I want to prove some arbitrary statement to you. So what I do is I run an MPC protocol myself between two parties, say, in my head. So I both, I'm both Alice and I'm Bob in my head. And so but because I know everything, I'm the prover. So I run both parties in my head. And then the proof is that you, the challenger, send me a challenge that says open Alice. And if I know the statement, it's the only way I can open Alice correctly is if I actually know the value I'm trying to prove correct. And so there is a zero knowledge proof technique called MPC in the head, which is doesn't require setup assumptions. It's quite slow, it's quite large, but um you know quite big. But it can do anything really any statement really really efficiently if you can write down a circuit for it. And, um, and it actually forms the basis of, of, of certain what's called post quantum signature schemes. So one of the big things happening in crypto at the moment is post quantum. And one of the, uh, post quantum signature schemes called picnic that's been submitted to the NIST competition is actually based on MPC in the head. 
So there's all sorts of different, everyone's kind of trying to find different ways of doing better zero knowledge, but it's basically speed of verifier, speed of prover, size of proof, and trusted startup assumptions are the things. And you always have to give up one. I think it's uh, interesting to look at an example like the millionaire's problem. If we go back to that, like you could have a zero knowledge proof in any system that says, yes, Alice has more money than Bob. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And like in a bulletproof system, it would be expensive to produce that proof. It might be pretty large. So it would make total sense if you want to prove to many people many times over time that Alice has more money than Bob. But if yeah, you're yeah. just trying to prove it once to Bob, then it doesn't make sense to go through all this trouble and it might be better to have an NPC to do it. Or if yeah, you're yeah. trying to prove bun um, like bunch of pairs in, like, in this system, like setting up a, a new trusted setup for each yeah. pair, it's way too complicated and expensive. So you need something else. And, yeah. 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 So you have different applications, domains, whatever. Yeah. So I think this leads us to... Our last questions, yeah. which is about like the future of these systems. So maybe you can tell me what, other than the NPC in the in the head or in my head, <laughs> what was it? NPC in the head. In the head. In the head. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like a '90s rap song. Or something. <laughs> what other kind new kinds of uh, NPC systems or NPC setups or techniques are you seeing emerging? Okay, so one of the big, um, I, I think, in terms of NPC, it's kind of we kind of. The, the basics are kind of done, and we're just getting more optimizations. So I think people are interested in what happens if there's a quantum computer built. So there's a lot of move to what happens for, uh, in the case of quantum computing, uh, making sure systems are secure against quantum computers. And that brings on to a whole thing that really, really touches the whole of the crypto, both cryptography and cryptocurrency space, which is what's called crypto agility is that you've seen in the last 10 years, um, you know, problems with ciphers and algorithms having to be retired. You know, MD5 was a big, was a hash function that was used everywhere in Windows. And this caused real problems for Microsoft having to remove the thousands of places it was used. And we kind of need to be able to have, how do you change a system which is already deployed quickly? So, one, you know, we're, we're currently... TLS 1.3 has currently been standardized. Trying to deploy it is quite hard. Actually, you know, it took ages to get rid of everybody to get rid of SSL 3, despite everyone knowing it was rubbish. You know, deploying new systems when things are broken is hard. Imagine blockchain, right? So imagine the hash function is broken. Okay. Yeah. How do you going to have to change all the hash functions instantly? So then it's not built into the system because it's built on consensus and the consent. Yeah, and how are they going to agree on changing the hash function? How are they going to agree on changing what digital signature to use? Now, if you, if you go this elliptic curve based on this, whatever it was, um, the, the, uh, the Koblitz curve, I can't remember which number it is. Yeah. That's used in, in Bitcoin. What happens if someone breaks that curve? You want to change everything overnight. What happens to all the signatures that have already been made? All of them are invalid instantly. Because you could have forged any signature, yeah? So you could have kept your, you, know, you don't know. So how do you do this crypto agility on a, on systems that are deployed? And people haven't really thought about that very much. So would that almost fall under the category of like upgradability? Yeah. Yeah. So it's Is that what you'd call it? Yeah. Upgrade. So it's called agility so that you can move, you can shift, you can quickly shift your cipher from A to B. Um, if, if you find out it's broken. And so I think. When people built the internet and the early systems in the 90s, they went, yeah, it's not, hey, come on, it's 90s, it's not going to last very long. It's just going to, you know, like this, we're going to just deploy some stuff and we're going to replace it very quickly. So they didn't really think about how you could upgrade things. And then this kind of habit got built in and engineers to go, oh, we're going to use this piece of crypto. It worked, boom. And then you see millions and millions of devices with, you know, one device might have a thousand pieces of crypto calls within it and you've got to kind of isolate all of them. If you if the algorithm is broken, you have yeah. to isolate all of them and replace them. It's a real real problem. It's a it's a huge problem not only in crypt, like if Bitcoin had to change its hash function, I mean it, it would be and I like it just wouldn't happen. I mean, I, I can't even imagine what would happen. Like, but they should be, they should be thinking about this now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and um, yeah, it, like I think Ethereum like. When it launched, it was a lot more agile. It was a lot more like, yeah, we, we know that things will change. We were thinking about, you know, quantum computers and they're like trying to, yeah. to, to think about it. But it's still like over time has stagnated and it's like almost to the same level 
as Bitcoin mm-hmm. and like not wanting to change. Um, yeah. So it's like a lot of the next generation of blockchains now are thinking about upgradability and like how do you keep a, an agile protocol, but it, it it's super hard. It's like a fundamentally difficult question. Yeah. I guess it's not only difficult technically, but also just socially. Like yeah. people, there's so much resistance from community. And, and also there are, you know, people who are a little evangelical about their favorite algorithm. You're going to use algorithm X because it's the best thing ever, you know, and, 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 and they won't, yeah, they won't shut up. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's so true. And it's so <laughs> funny. Have you, I mean, do you see this in academia all the oh, time? Oh yeah, as well? all like, the time. It's yeah. really, really, yeah, it's really a pain. <laughs> So you kind of mentioned earlier on this post-quantum yeah. work. When you mentioned this sort of bit, the Bitcoin hash function could be broken, like, is it post-quantum? No, the Bitcoin hash function, the, the Bitcoin signature scheme is not post-quantum. The Bitcoin hash function is in some sense post-quantum in the fact that it's a hash function, except the Bitcoin hash function is based on what's called the MD family. Now, MD should go, you know, light up bells because that's MD5. It comes from the same stable as MD5. It's tweaked version of MD5. It's a more complex version of MD5. So it's called SHA2. And SHA2 is based on SHA1, which is based on SHA0, which is based on MD5, which is based on MD4, which is based on MD2. And they have been broken in order. MD2 was broken, then MD4, then MD5, then SHA0, then SHA1. And now we're on SHA2. And they're going like, you know, it's only going to take a matter of time. It might be 10 years. It might be one year. It might be 100 years. But it's the same family. It's the same. The same technique should apply. It's just a more complex version of something that's already been broken. Do you believe that actually everything... Everything that's being will created be broken. today. It will everything, be broken. Everything will be broken. The question, wow. yeah. But so, so, but in the rest of well, so the U.S. government already reacted to this. So there is a SHA three, and SHA three is from a completely different family. So SHA three, SHA three looks to SHA two like AES looks to DES. They just look different, you know. So the attack techniques you'd use on SHA two do not apply to SHA three, and SHA threes a much more interesting algorithm. You can use it for much more different things. So that was um, so that was created by uh, some Belgians. I now live in Belgium because Belgium is the home of cryptography. So your listeners may remember that AES comes from Belgium. So hopefully, SHA, and SHA-3 comes from Belgium. So our hope is that the winner of the NIST competition for the post-quantum algorithms will also come from Belgium because we think that just should be the definition is that good crypto algorithms should come from Belgium. <laughs> But in the case of Ethereum, what are they? What are they actually? What's used there? So I'm led to believe it's using Ketchak, um, which is SHA three. So that's a, a different one, um, and hopefully we'll get a uh, microprocessor support for SHA three in the next few years. There's a funny uh, like story or like oddity of the Ethereum protocol that uh, Ethereum uses Ketchak two fifty six, which is. SHA-3 before it won the NIST competition. So it, it's um, SHA-3 went into NIST and, and like had from Ketchak 256 to SHA-3, there was a small tweak and some like hardcore Ethereum people when, when this was going through was theorizing that maybe this tweak was applied by like a government agency to try to inject oh some, some knowledge or something. <laughs> so they stuck with Ketchak 256. There's a good story there about yeah. this. So DES was modified between the submission and the thing, and everyone thought it was because the U.S. government had modified to make it weaker. Actually, what happened was the U.S. Mo- government modified to make it stronger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to wrap up, what would you say that you're looking forward to the most over the, the coming little while? Like what new technologies, new projects, whatever it may be? Okay, so uh, cool things that are coming up is the excitement of the NIST post-quantum crypto competition. So who's going to win? Is it going to be Belgium? Is it going to be someone else? And and of course, they're not. They're, they're saying it's not a competition, so there's not going to be a winner. And you're going like, yeah, right. Everyone's going to still treat it as a winner. And so it's really um, important. And there's so that's going to be like what people settle on for encryption and 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 uh, signatures. I think. There's a lot of work on zero knowledge proofs and proving those we've already touched on. I, I think um, a lot of people think, um, you know, MPC in the head, I think might be pushed a lot further. I think applications of MPC in the real world are going to really take off. 
we're going to see lots of you know we've already touched on a number in in this in this in this podcast and i think this could be a load there and then there's like really weird and wacky stuff you know like um the, the cryptographers always come up with this you know things there's this there was this idea a few years ago called indistinguishable obfuscation which is a way of obfuscating code i could give you the code and you don't know what the code program does it's kind of but that that's kind of died a bit in terms of research at the moment um, but there are these things keep popping up one of the things we've noticed is that a lot of times something will be developed. It'll be kind of exciting, but maybe not yet useful. It'll die down and then come back in some yeah. new form. Is there anything in like early research that you would love to see come back? Oh, I or don't know. Be picked up? I think the thing is, is that if it was in early research, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of weird in, in that the fact is, is that you go back and you go, oh yeah, duh. It was and, actually and there. It was already there. So, for example, we already talked about trust execution environments. We're already in the FHE paper, you know, and you go like, but everyone forgets it. And so, actually, if I knew what was kind of cool in the past, that's what I would now be doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I guess that suggests we should be on the lookout. Yeah, 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 yeah. you got to look out. And, and things, things come back and, um, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of an interesting You kind of – you always see new things – the world revolves and you get new things coming. The old things cool. come back and they look like new. So what are you working on next? Ooh. Or now? Currently, we're working on some MPC in the head ideas to do more efficient generalized proofs. We're looking at improvements for MPC protocols. Um, we have um, some our speeds protocol. We've embodied it in a piece of software called Scale, S-C-A-L-E, which we've been we're now maintaining and... Uh, using that in a number of applications. So people can download that and play with that as an MPC system. Um, we're looking to, we're always looking to recruit new people. I mean, this, the whole area is really hot. There's not a single cryptographer on the planet who hasn't got a large number of job openings. So if anyone listening to wow. this would like to come and work in Leuven, which is the biggest crypto group in on the planet, uh, we have the inventor of AES. One of the inventors of AES just works down from the corridor from me. So whatever, it, we have work on Bitcoin and symmetric ciphers privacy and uh everything is going on in Leuven it's we've got about 70 people working on cryptography just in Leuven so if you're interested please just drop us a line and come and work with us thank you very much for being on the podcast it was a pleasure no problem very interesting and to our listeners thanks for listening thanks for listening thanks for listening